mostly for people who are not lawyers or not focused on licensing, the idea of open source is very broad. Um, but uh, it's actually important what the precise definition is because it has a lot of implications for the kinds of issues that we're going to talk about today. So lots of people use the term open source to mean just something where source code is available to people or they even use it to refer to software that's free of charge. Um, and that can get confusing because when we set compliance rules for open source licenses, uh, we're really relying on them being sort of the true definition of open source. And if we can't rely on that definition, then we have to introduce some more complexity into compliance requirements. So that's why, you know, it's, it's not merely pedantry <laughs> to talk about the precise definition of open source it actually makes a difference to how you manage open source compliance day to day. So let's talk about the precise definition. And, and you know, you can look at the open source definition, which is managed by the open source initiative or the free software definition, which is done by Free Software Foundation. They're, in substance, they're actually pretty similar. Um, but the one fundamental concept about open source, other than source code availability, of course, is that it allows the software to be freely used for any purpose. It grants all the rights of copyright and it doesn't impose any, um, any restrictions on the use of the software. It can impose conditions. Lots of people get confused about the difference, but a condition is if you do this thing, you have to do the other, this other thing. Like, um, you know, for instance, if, if you drive a car, you have to get a license, but you don't have to get a license if you're not going to drive your car. Um, so it can have conditions and licenses like GPL impose significant conditions, permissive licenses, impose hardly any conditions at all. Um, but to be open source, the most important overarching quality is no license restrictions, no field restrictions, no market restrictions, no territory restrictions, and so forth. Um, as a contrast, proprietary licenses impose limitations. And the kind of old style way of doing this is to impose limitations on number of servers or number of users. In the old days, we used to do site licenses, CPU licenses, but that's mostly gone by the wayside. The, the point is that if you're licensed for 100 users and you use a software for 200 users, those extra 100 users are actually not licensed. And so you've actually violated the license and, and have potentially um, engaged in copyright infringement by exceeding the license restrictions. And proprietary licenses have all sorts of restrictions. Once you get out of the open source or the pure open source realm, it can be anything. You know, it can say you can only use this for testing purposes. You can only use it uh, with 100 users. You can only use it uh, with these specific products. Or you have to uh, have a bundling requirement, like you can't sell it on a standalone basis. Those are the kinds of limitations that proprietary licenses impose. Recently, we've seen um, a very strong uh, tendency for uh, companies who are releasing open source uh, or software to um, to instead move into a new category, which is kind of a combination of the two called source available. By the way, there's no real definition of source available. It's just kind of what people call this, this category. And I would say it's, it's become extremely popular in the last five years or so. Um, and that uh, is a new kind of license that has the quality that it makes source code available, but it imposes some license restrictions. And when we talk about source available today, that's what we mean. It's, it's deployed like an open source license and it might, you know, and people might uh, mistakenly refer to it as an open source license, but it's really not the same thing 
because it has a license restriction. Well